Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the sad story of Emmeline Burns. Um, so in the last episode, well, what happened was, Toma Andrews, the original protagonist of the game, uh, had come across this girl who seemed like a ghost, named Emily. And this ghost girl named Emily decided to tell Toma Andrews a story about... A, a story related to a gravestone. The gravestone of Emmeline Burns. And uh, with that, what has continued to happen is we've just, you know, found out that uh, Emmeline Burns and Cornelia... I can't remember her last name. <laughs> um, Emmeline Burns and Cornelia are really, really good best buddies, and they're also, you know, seems to be a little bit more um, some feelings blossoming between them that seem more than just friends. They've already kissed before, and they've held hands, and at some point, I think that they're gonna go skinny dipping into the lake, though um, that might just be a little bit too far. <laughs> Um, yeah. I wouldn't put it past them to have tried, though. Um, yeah. Um, also, uh, so last- the last episode ended when we heard that Emmeline, this girl on the left, uh, Emmeline's father returned from London with some bad news, so we don't know what. But he seems a changed man, like he's lost something vital about him. And with that, let's continue. <clears throat> <clears throat> Cornelia Are you alright, Emily? Emmy? Hmm? Emmeline blinked, brushing a few strands out of out of hair out of her face and turned. Why do you ask? Was it was my face contorted in a cu curious manner? I suppose you could say that. You have been up. You have been acting rather more despondent than usual, that is all. Ha! <laughs> a cat-like smile across Emmeline's lips. She leaned forwards until her nose was only inches apart from her companions and said in hushed tones, Are you worried about me, Nanny? I... I... I was worried about you, but I shall not worry any longer if you insist upon acting like that. Emmeline only giggled, unmoved by Cornelia's protestations, and rearranged her hair. Seeing you blush always cheers me up, my dear Cornelia. So you admit that you were feeling unhappy earlier? Just a touch. I cannot help myself, not when father has been acting in such a peculiar manner. He shambles about the house like an animated corpse, like the misunderstood creature from Mr. Shelley's novel. Miss? Mr. Shelley? I thought the author of Frankenstein was Mrs. Shelley, not her husband. Oh, I am unsure of the details, Nellie. Mother says a woman could not have written such a twisted tale, and I do not know what I should believe. In any event, it does not particularly matter. Probably not. No. Emmeline ran a hand through her auburn curls. Or at least, she tried to. She soon found that her bonnet got in the way of this gesture, so she untied the ribbon beneath her chin and removed the offending garment. <laughs> she let her bonnet sit in her lap as a mother might with a newly born babe and played with the light green ribbon, twisting it about the wrist of her right arm. The sensation of the s soft, smooth material against her skin was comforting, like a caress. To be quite honest, I have been rather concerned about father. Just this morning, he missed a stair during his descent into the hallway and sprained his ankle. Could have broken his leg. But he did not. No, he did not. He does look rather undignified now, though, limping everywhere like an invalid. Oh, Emily. Emmeline shifted, still playing with the ribbon of her bonnet. The look on Cornelia's face was too somber. 
for a playful forest sprite such as herself, and it was unsettling. She did not want to think about her father. She had retreated to the Linton's estate. <laughs> Moving in my chair. Despite the protestations of Miss Warren, you have not finished your history lesson, Emily. Oh, you have not finished your history lesson, Miss Emily. I doubt you could tell Queen L Elizabeth apart from a hole in the ground. So she could avoid thinking about her father. This was rather new for, for Emily. She had always loved being with her father. Now, however, she found herself seeking any recourse available to her to avoid him. Seeing him like this, so small and sad, shuffling about his home like a repentant sinner, was too painful. When you return home, would you give your father my regards? Mother is awfully concerned about him, and you too, Emmeline. Hmm. Beatrice Linton would be concerned. She has always loved poking her nose into other people's business. She is not doing it because she enjoys idle gossip. You should know better than anyone that my mother deplores that kind of behavior. She believes it to be most unpleasant. She could not help but feel worried. Given what she has read in the papers lately, your family has a great deal invested in the East Anglian railways, do they not? Don't talk to me about business, Nelly. I can't understand it at all. I am sure you could if you tried. You have just been raised to believe that you should not bother. Gosh, you sound more and more like your mother every day. Emmeline exhaled, tightening the ribbon of her bonnet about her wrist so much so it had started to hurt. Though the material was soft, intended for wear by young women with silken skin who had never worked a day in their privileged little lives, it chafed when she wound it up as such about her wrist. It was strange, Emmeline mused, how something as innocuous as a ribbon could cause harm when it was used with malicious intent. This world was more dangerous than she had ever truly given it credit for. Even the lake, which she had often gazed upon with Cornelia, could be hiding some sinister secrets within its depths. Ooh. That only reminds me of a different game I've played before called, um, I think it's, was it like Mermaid Lake or something? Um, I'll link it in the, in the description. It's a horror game, an RPG horror game about, um, about a haunted lake, basically. But people trying to figure out why it's haunted and how to lift the curse. It was really good when I played it back when I was much younger. <laughs> I apologize, Nelly. I don't mean to snap at you. I've been rather highly strung as of late. It must be because of the atmosphere at home. Do not fret, Emmy. I understand. You, you do? Not entirely, but I will try to. I, um, I do care about you after all. <laughs> Thank you, Nellie. The two girls looked at one another, unusually shy, hesitant, their faces lightly flushed. Then, with a tut, Cor Cornelia leant forwards, brushing the tips of her fingers against Emmeline's wrist. You should not do that. What? Fiddle with your bonnet like that. Because it is unbecoming of a lady? Because you are hurting yourself. Your poor hand has gone white. The blood cannot flow through your body properly if you impede it like that. <laughs> and your hands, by contrast, still appear to be red, Nelly. Emmeline giggled and began to unwind the ribbon from about her wrist. Are you still yet to master the sacred art of the cross stitch? That is neither here nor there. I'm trying to comfort you, Emmeline. And you have been doing a wonderful job. Gazing upon your many imperfections always cheers me. You are so cruel, Emmeline. 
Sometimes I feel like you do not truly love me. You just love toying with me. Now, now, where did you get a silly idea like that? Emmeline smiled with a touch less sarcasm than before and leant forwards, then moving quickly as a kittywake might pluck a fish out of the water. I hope I pronounced that right. <laughs> she pressed a chaste kiss against the corner of Cornelia's lips. I love you more than ever. Nothing could quell my feelings for you, not a raging storm or a howling wind. Cornelia pressed one hand against her cheek gingerly. The spot where Emmeline had kissed her tingled. It felt much like being poked with a sewing needle, a sensation Cornelia was depressingly familiar with, but it was not unpleasant. Your blushes are truly beautiful, Cornelia. They would even outdo the roses in the midst of summer. It makes me wish I could kiss you every single second of the day if it would always elicit such a lovely response. I do not think my heart would be able to cope with such a constant slew of affection. You would kill me, Emmy. And what better way would there be to die than to be kissed fervently by a girl you love? And with a light giggle even breezier than that of the coastal air, Emmeline pressed another kiss against the side of Cornelia's mouth. You, you know, you should ask for my permission before you do that. I'm not quite as hungry for affection as you are. So you say, but you did not offer much resistance. That sounds like something Aubrey would say. Never. You would not seek to compare me to that cur again, would you, Nelly? I am simply saying what I see. You claim to dislike Aubrey, but you grow more and more like him with every passing day. That is a lie. Or, whoops. That is a lie. Libel, slander. Take it back. No. Take it back, I said. I refuse. Well, I insist. If you want me to change my mind, you will have to insist harder than that. All right, then. How is this? Oh, with a devilish glint in her eyes, which would have been evidence enough only a couple of centuries past to try her as a witch, Emmeline shifted forwards and began her merciless assault. Not even William of Nor Normandy, as he drove back the armies of Harold Godwinson during the Battle of Hastings, could have conceived of such brutality. <laughs> Emmy, Emmy, stop that! Cornelia kicked and squealed, pushing back against the ground by Emmeline's sudden siege, but it was to no avail. Emmeline had the element of surprise on her side, and she had taken a clear advantage. Cornelia blinked up at Emmeline, squirming like a hooked fish, as Emmeline sat astride her. Skirts rucked up her thighs, her fingers trailing lines across Cornelia's prone body beneath her chin, under her arms against her sides. Was there any war tactic more vicious, more wicked, more devious than that of tickling? And thus was not just any tickling, oh no. Or, oh, whoops, and this was not just any tickling, oh no. This was extreme tickling that would surely end in bloodshed. Oh my god. My terrible, terrible brain has heard some crazy stories about extreme tickling. <laughs> I will not talk about that though. Emmy, stop! Get off me! Cornelia implored breathlessly, choking the words from between her pursed lips. But the indomitable, indomitable, Indomitable Emmeline remained unmoved. No, I will not. Not until you recant what you said. That you are like Aubrey? Indeed, admit it to be nothing more than a lie, and I may spare your life. No, never. I stand by my word. Then I will stand by my actions. I will not stop unless until you surrender. Nellie, and I warn you, I can be very persuasive when I want to be. Her eyes hardening like the steel of a sword's blade, Emmeline dipped her head and began to press kisses against Cornelia's neck. 
Cornelia's dress had begun to slip down her shoulders, and there was a good deal of pale pink skin on show, more than would have been deemed socially appropriate. Ah! You rogue! You would attack a helpless young girl? Only because this helpless young girl is attempting to defile my honor. So, you would seek to defile me? Well, I wonder... Cornelia squealed as though she had been doused in water and redoubled her efforts to escape, but it was all in vain. The two girls continued to bicker playfully, giggling even as the warmth of the sun began to dissipate and an autumnal chill settled into the air. At that moment, as the day drew to a close, the two girls may truly have believed, with their rumpled clothes and disordered hair and flustered cheeks, that this could last forever. Emmeline was dreaming, though she was not sure what it was exactly she was what it was exactly she was dreaming of. Her dreams were mostly comprised of vague shapes and distorted sounds, as though she were viewing her own fantasy lands from behind frozen glass or through a fine film of water. Sometimes, however, she dreamt of Cornelia. She always knew when she had dreamt of Cornelia, because when she awoke, it was with a silly smile on her face and a soft flush across her cheeks. That was how she had realized she was in love. She was always thinking of Cornelia, even during the rare occasions when Cornelia was not beside her. Though Emmeline was only fourteen and she did not fully understand what love was, she did not need to. Why trouble herself over the intricacies of the four-letter word when she could? Instead, be doing things that made her happy, those things being, chiefly, talking to Cornelia, braiding her hair, making her blush, and kissing her lips, her cheeks, her eyelids. Emmeline was not particularly picky. Ooh, the clock is like really loud and very ominous. On this particular night, however, Emmeline did not awake to find sunlight streaming in through her window, half-formed remembrances of her love flitting through her mind. She did not awake during the morning at all. It must have been late at night, because it was pitch black in her bedroom, and she could not hear any birds. It was earlier than five, then, she assumed, for she had no way of knowing if this was correct or not. It was so dark in her room she could not see the clock that hung on her wall, though she could hear its ticking. The first point she was aware of, other than the oppressive darkness, was that it was cold. The chill of winter was well and truly setting in, especially during the night, and she could no longer sleep with bare arms and a light coverlet as she had done before. Her summer sleepwear had been packed away at the back of her wardrobe, and the maids now set her winter nightgowns on her bed before she went to sleep, complete with puff sleeves and high collars. The second thing Emmeline noticed as her eyes slowly grew accustomed to the dark was that she was not alone. There was somebody else in the room with her. Okay, so I know this is normally like, you know, people freaking out as I would be too if I woke up, but I think it's her father. It was, oh, it was none other than her father, Philip. Emmeline stared at her father with wide eyes. He looked back at her and Emmeline could tell, despite the dark, that he was just as surprised, if not more, than she was. Had his face always looked so lined, his mouth so drawn? Perhaps the shadows were playing tricks with her eyes, but he looked far older than his forty-four years. Emmeline swallowed. All of a sudden, her throat felt dry. Father? Is something wrong? Nothing's wrong, Emmy. Nothing at all. But he did not look at her face, and he stuttered when he spoke. Why did he sound so frightened? Had something bad happened? Emmeline could not think of any other reason why he would be in her room at such an hour, looking so very tired. No, tired did not even begin to describe it. He looked haggard, as though on the brink of death, and his hands would not stop shaking, even when he clenched them into fists. Emmeline sat up in bed, the covers falling about her body like a funeral shroud. 
and looked at her father with concern. It isn't mother, is it? Is she sick? Your mother? Er, hmm. Your, your mother? She's fine, I mean, she should be sleeping now. Oh. A pause. And why are you not asleep, father? Could you not? No, I... There's something I have to do. At this hour? Yes. It is of utmost importance. I don't imagine you would understand. Emmeline flinched. Her father's voice was strangely hard, despite the nervous stammer, and she was not used to him talking to her in such a way. Um, let me go back and revoice that line then. Yes. It is of utmost importance. It is of utmost importance. I don't imagine you would understand. Emmeline flinched. Her father's voice was strangely hard despite the nervous stammer, and she was not used to him talking to her in such a way. Maybe other girls' fathers spoke in such terse, clipped terms. Cornelia's father sometimes did. When Beatrice wasn't there to chastise him, but not her father. <coughs> Not Philip Burns. There was no warmth to his voice, no tenderness. It was as though he were speaking to a stranger rather than his dear daughter, his priceless jewel, his lovely little Emmeline. I may not understand what it is you wish to do, father, but are you sure I cannot help? No. Nobody can. But... I appreciate the offer, Emmy, but it, it is far too late. Her father swallowed. Emmeline could hear it. It sounded painful, as though he were attempting to choke down a lead bullet or a piece of steel shrapnel. I, I do not understand. If you do not believe I can help you, why did you come to my room? What, it is, you, what is it you wish to discuss with me, father? There. I... Oh, God. Philip's shoulders shook. It sounded like he was trying to stem a flow of oncoming tears, though he was not entirely successful. He bit down on his lower lip, but moisture still sparkled in the corners of his eyes, threatening to spill down his cheeks like April rain. If Grandmother Patience were here, she would have mocked him. She always had done when Philip was a child. Perhaps that was why Philip never never visited Grandmother Patience. She made him feel like a young boy again, small, stupid, and utterly insignificant. That was why Philip had gone into banking. Though he was not suited for such a cutthroat industry, he didn't have the knack for it. Never had done. Grandmother Patience had said as much, but he was determined to prove her wrong. He wanted, for once in his life, to make her proud. And look what that had cost him. His wealth, his reputation, and now, worst of all, his family, too. But there was no going back now. Father? Father, are you alright? What's wrong? Emily. Oh, my dear Emily. I am sorry. I am so, so sorry. I tried to be a good father, Emmy. I really did. I wanted to be kind. I wanted to be fair. I had no intention of treating you like my parents treated me, but I... I was incapable of doing it. In the end, it all went wrong. I thought I knew what I was doing. I thought I was succeeding. And for a while, Maybe I was. Now I realize that was a foolish fantasy dreamt by a foolish man. My mother was right. I should have been drowned when I was young. It would have saved you all so much trouble. It would have made everything so much easier. to her feet, her bare toes curling against the wooden floorboards, and took a few steps forward. 
Are you not feeling well? We can call for the physician if you would like, if only you would sit down. Look how much you are trembling. No, 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 no. Philip shook his head mechanically, back and forth like a tin soldier, his words spoken in an almost frenzied fervor. The physician cannot help now. Nothing can help. We're done for, Emily. You and I, and your mother too. This is it. This is the end. The end of what, exactly? Our money is gone, Emily. I made a terrible mistake and now everything is gone. The bubble burst and we lost it all. Every single thing. Emmeline stared at her father, her mouth open. She did not know what to do, what to say. What could she say? She was only 14 years old, and she had always been told by her mother that women had no place in the world of business. It was only natural when they could not understand facts and figures or tables of numbers. Beatrice Linton was the exception, rather than the rule. Beatrice Linton could do anything. She could have probably wrestled a bear to death with her own two hands if needs be, but Emmeline could not. She was only a young girl, standing in her bedroom in her winter nightgown, shivering like a leaf, and she did not know what to do. But she did not need to ponder her own powerlessness for much longer. I'm sorry, Emmy. I'm so, so sorry. I let you down. I let you down, and now... This is the only thing I can do to make amends. Father, what are you? But Emmeline was not able to finish her question. That is because at that moment, Philip Burns closed the distance between them and held his hand around his daughter's throat. His fingers dug into her skin and Emmeline could not breathe. First, it was the shock that drew the air out of her lungs. Then it was the pressure about her throat, choking her. She could hardly believe it. How could her father, who had never raised a hand to her in his life, who had never raised so much as his voice, even contemplate carrying out such a hideous action? But he was. He really was going to kill her. Emmeline felt herself growing faint. She wondered idly if dark purple bruised bruises would be left around her throat when Philip let go. A fairy circle made of mushrooms. Her head swam, her legs gave way beneath her, and she fell backwards onto her bed. Still, Philip's fingers did not budge. They remained upon her throat, fixated with the gruesome task they had been charged with. It was almost as though Philip Burns had split in two. One half remained focused on the murder of his dear daughter, his beloved Emmy, while the other, appalled at his actions, looked away with disgust. Maybe he should have poisoned her nightly mug of hot cocoa and hot. Sorry. <laughs> Maybe he should have poisoned her nightly mug of hot cocoa instead. Then he wouldn't have had to bear witness to the look on her face, as the life was slowly choked out of her tiny body. I'm sorry, Emmy. I'm so, so sorry. And he was, too. His cheeks were wet with tears, and more tears kept falling. Some of them splashed against Emily's cheeks, but this offering of remorse made little difference. Emily was still dying. She had been dying for around two minutes now, though it felt like it had been far longer and her heart was already starting to stammer inside her chest. I'm doing it for you, Emmy. It's for the greater good, I promise. I cannot stand the thought of my little girl, girl going to the workhouse. I just couldn't. I, I... But Philip did not know what else to say. 
He doubted it would have made much of a difference. Emmeline stared up at the ceiling blankly, her eyes a vast sea of white, her mouth hanging open. Her arms and legs were limp, and though her body was warm, it did not move. It could not. Philip removed his hands from Emmeline's throat, but Emmeline did not stir. His, her eyes remained open, unfixed, misty with death. Emmy! Oh, my Emmy! My little Emmy! With a choked sob, Philip pulled his dear little girl, who was now a very dead little girl, into his arms and wept. And with that, we end our episode here. Thank you all for coming on this journey, and we still have more of the story left. So please remember to come back. I will see you all 